Greetings, this is Kim Pond from UMass Extension, and I would like to welcome you to the first of four geospatial a series of webinars preparing for the 2013 4-H National Youth Science Day Experiment and beyond. These webinars are being conducted by members of the NAE 4-HA Geospatial Task Force in partnership with National 4-H Council in Esri. Today's topic, Learning to Think Spatially, will be presented by Beth Heck and Christy Fitzpatrick. Both Beth and Christy come with, us with several years of experience working with geospatial youth development programs. Beth currently works for National Council as part of the customer relations team overseeing the My4H resource portal. Christy works as a regional STEM specialist at Colorado State University. Christy was an instrumental player in creating this year's National Youth Science Geospatial Experiment. I'll now turn it over to Beth. Thank you, Kim, and thank you, everyone, for joining our first of four National Youth Science Day Geo Webinars. Let's begin by visiting our itinerary. Our main objective in conducting the NYSD Geo Webinar Series is to help our professional and for key volunteers to become more knowledgeable so that they're able to be comfortable to lead and train others to lead a NYSD geospatial activity, and secondly, to go beyond just the NYSD event and lead additional geospatial activities with youth. Now, this particular webinar is going to serve as your starting point. We'll first visit the full purpose of NYSD and what's available to you so that you can really get the most benefit. Christy will then discuss the foundational understanding of what is geospatial to provide an overview of how the NYSC low-tech activities connect to the high-tech GIS concept. And finally, we'll share how you can learn about additional resources and engage with one another to further support your learning and your programs. Will be the sixth year for 4 H to conduct this premier national rallying event we call National Youth Science Day, or NYSD for short. In the past, content has focused on water, biofuel, wind power, and robotics. This year's focus is on geospatial and is called Maps and Apps. The official event is scheduled for Wednesday, October 9th, which is during National 4 H Week. While it's hoped that you hold a special event on that day, it's understood there may be a better time of the month to fit the schedule of your community and your partners. Holding an event or events during this time period will allow your program to be a part of the national movement and reap the perks that come with it. So why participate in NYSC? What's its purpose? The answer is actually twofold. First, NYSC aims to spark youth interest in science. The activities expose them to hot topics and career paths. It broadens their interest as they learn, in a fun way, how to apply science to making a difference in the world around them. The second reason, and really the primary reason for initiating NYSC, goes beyond the classroom. Participating in NYSC provides an ideal opportunity to attract new supporters and donors to bring media coverage to 4-H in a comprehensive sweep across the country. It's an opportunity to invite people to the table to see the different, another side of 4-H, those decision makers, those key stakeholders, new partners, even new volunteers. It's an opportunity to increase the visibility of the 4-H brand and to become part of the national movement around 4-H youth and science. While it's important to reach out and get youth involved in the experiment, don't overlook the importance and the value of using this event as a PR platform in creating buy-in for potential individuals, groups, or organizations. If planned right, your NYSD event could really build those bridges needed to expand your 4-H program, reach, and support for years to come. But don't wait. You do need to begin planning now. The first Thank place you. you want to go to get started on the NYSD to get started, you want to go to the NYC website. This is where you'll find the National 4-H Council resources specifically for the 2013 National Youth Science Day. Yeah. Upon landing on the 4-H.org slash NYSC site, 
You'll need to log in to have access to all the resources. The login process is pretty simple. Your email will become your username and you'll create your own password. And anyone can have access to the site. It's not just limited to 4-H professionals. Once you've logged in to the NYSC site, access to a, you'll have access to a variety of resources. The experiment guides are now available on the site. There's a youth and a there's a youth guide and there's also a facilitator's guide. These are where you'll actually find the, the two official NYSD activities. Note the activities are created to target the middle school age. The 2013 NYSD one-page fact sheet is also available there. This is a great resource to duplicate and hand out to potential funders and partners. Additional poster and print ads are forthcoming. This should contain information that will be helpful in working with the media. Also, coming down the pike is a how-to video. This video will provide an animated demonstration on how to conduct activity number one as listed in the youth and adult. Uh, the uh, how-to demonstration video is currently in production and it's going to be available um, year or around August 30th, barring any delays. The experiment kits are also available for pre-order. You can pre-order your kits now at the 4-H Mall. A kit contains everything you need to compl complete Activity 1, with the exception of some small items like binder clips and tape. One kit is ideal for about eight participants, as it contains one set of transparencies, which serves, um, it, it serves as eight layers in the activity. Ideally, each kid would be assigned one layer, unless some kids want to, create, to collaborate on a layer. That said, the kit is reusable. The cost is $24.95 a kit, and the shipments will begin in very early September, probably right after Labor Day. Another resource that will be available is the online app. It's going to be an online version of Activity 1. It's going to be similar to a game simulation. The app will be available for tablets, iPads, desktops, not so much smartphones as the interface will be too small. But uh, realize the app is just going to contain the activity component. It will not contain any kind of analytical piece. So you, or whoever is leading the group of youth, will still need to provide that reflect and apply process to make it a true educational experience. The NYSC online app is due to launch in September. There will also be an NYSC event map on the site. The event map is created as users, such as yourself, register your NYSC event. When you register each of your events, you'll include the name, the location, the date, the time, a brief description, projected number of participants and volunteers, and of course your state, city and state. For each and every NYSC event you conduct, you will register the event so it'll appear in a comprehensive NYSC map. This is really important as it provides strength to the national movement. It also increases your program's visibility to your local stakeholders. And it'll make you be eligible for the Innovation Awards. I'm happy to share that the registration feature is available this week on the site, the NYSC site. As time progresses, you'll see a photo gallery on the site. The photo gallery is created as a result of the users, like yourself, logging back into the site to share your pictures. You'll be able to upload three photos and one video per event that you register. And finally, there will be innovation awards to apply for. Awards cre are created as an incentive to host events and bring visibility and attention to the 4-H brand. These in the past have been cash awards, uh, one winner per category, and the dollars go to the program hosting the event. The exact categories for this year have not been determined yet, but it's highly likely that they're going to focus on the promotion and media outreach. You know, what's the level of media involvement in your event? featuring 4-H science in the brand. Another category may relate to the connection to careers using um, STEM and related partnerships. Just remember, your events have to be registered on the site to be eligible. I'll now turn it over to Christy to talk some more about this year's content, 
geospatial. So this year's G National Youth Science Day activity, the topic overall was geospatial technology. We have some goals for this year. We want the kids to develop an understanding of geospatial technology through hands-on activity. Uh, so we want them to have a chance to kind of see how, how a GIS map would work. We want them to apply basic GIS principles that include things like figuring out how to categorize things into features groups, how to study data by creating layers, and how to use maps to solve problems. We want them to use the geographic inquiry process to practice geospatial thinking. And we want to inspire them to look at some other geospatial projects and potentially some geospatial careers. So what is GIS? It's a good idea to break down uh, the words involved in the acronym. So geographic talks about where things are in the world, so the, where, the question of where. Geographic describes spatial data, or data that tells us where things are. Information, of course, describes and informs. It tells us what something is like, or how it works, or how it changed, or how much there is. So information is the what. We often talk about uh, information as attribute data, so things that are uh, non-spatial uh, information that's related to locations or spatial data. And finally, it's a system. So GIS is a system, a collection of hardware, software, data, and people who pull all of these pieces together to answer questions and solve problems. So GIS helps to propose and answer questions and solve problems that talk about uh, relating the where and the what. So what's going on where and why? So what is a GIS map? GIS. The power of GIS is the ability to make maps that make relationships easily apparent. So for example, if in your town you wanted to, to make a map of, of where are traffic accidents, you could map a layer of the town and the street, put in a layer of where are there traffic lights, stop signs, crosswalks, put in another layer of where accidents take place. And you can begin to see, are there more accidents on corners that don't have lights than on ones that do? Are there, are there more accidents on corners with crosswalks or not crosswalks? And then you can start to think about what does this data mean? So it's kind of a, a whole idea of relating a lot of things quickly. Uh, most GIS maps begin with an existing base map. It provides background reference information, so things like roads, political boundaries, landforms, and it kind of gives the underlying geography. Yeah. On top of the base map, you begin to add layers, and layers are really the key part of what makes GIS so powerful. Each layer can contain information about different kinds of features uh, associated with that area. Features that are related are grouped together and mapped as one layer. For example, all the parks in your community might be a layer. All the public buildings might be another. Another layer shows where public transportation can be found. So you can quickly and easily see how easy it is for people who don't drive, youth and seniors, for example, to get to parks and community buildings. An analysis that could, analysis that could require reading tons of text can reveal a problem almost instantly when it's, when it's put in such a visual way. So a GIS map is a visual guide to thinking spatially. And how does it do that? Again, we talked about the idea of layers. But we also want to talk for just a second about what is spatial thinking. Uh, we talk about, about it being important for kids. And really, the, the kind of quick way, with great thanks to Joseph Percy here, is that spatial thinking is the why of where. Why are things where they are? Have you ever wondered when you were driving along somewhere, why is there a cemetery out in the middle of nowhere? You know, the answer might be there was a town here. We don't actually know. So why do we think that spatial, why did we want to emphasize spatial thinking for youth? Why was it so important that we chose it for National Youth Science Day? Well, for one reason, it helps kids increase their awareness of the world around them. Looking for data increases observation skills, and not only that, it gets kids outdoors. It's a visual way to analyze a lot of data quickly and use it to make sophisticated judgments and decisions. It's a way to use right brain and left brain. It's a way to bring in different kinds of thinkers and different kinds of skills. It's a tool for discovering
Which relationship one? and making sense of the facts that you learn in school. So, for example, why are certain ecosystems located where they are? It helps create a habit of looking for and answering questions. Really looking at your community, looking at your world, and saying, why is this happening you here? It's an important way to communicate to the community um, all of the issues that, that are important. It's a way to present um, problems and possible solutions. And it has That's a wide variety of career show. applications. So some examples of spatial thinking questions. Why are things where they are? Why are there lilac bushes in, in rural areas? Was there a homestead there? Why are there good crop yields, crop yields in one part of a field and not another? Why do things happen where they do? Why do we have volcanoes on the Pacific Rim and not in Minnesota? Why would this be a good place to put something new? Would this be a good place for a business? Would this be a good place for a wildlife corridor? So these are all spatial thinking. Asking these questions expands our ability to, do, to think about um, spatial questions. What we're going to be using for National Youth Science Day is the geographic inquiry process. And it, you can think about geographic, the geographic inquiry process a lot like the scientific method or the engineering design process that engineers and scientists do. It's a framework that geographers use uh, to think about the questions that they're addressing. We're going to be using the geographic inquiry process in National Youth Science Day and in the, in the activities to help kids process somewhat like the steps of the experiential learning model. So the five steps are to ask a geographic question. Think about why and where. So we could ask a question about why is there more trash in certain areas of this park than others. Then we're going to acquire some geographic resources. We can gather data. In our case with the trash, maybe we'll go out and we'll map the locations of trash in the park. We'll get the data together. We'll get the maps that we need. Next, we're going to look uh, we're going to explore our geographic data. So we're going to create some visuals. In our case, it's going to be maps. So we're going to create maps of that trash. Where is it? What are the sort of underlying geographic things? What are the, what are the neighborhoods like? And we're going to look for patterns. So how many trash cans, for example, are already located in the areas where we're picking up trash? We're going to do an analysis. We're going to observe our visuals and try to draw some conclusions. So why is trash in certain why is there more trash in certain places than others? So for example, is there are there places where fences catch trash? Are there places where we just don't have enough trash cans? So next we can act on our knowledge. So are there places in town where more trash cans might make a difference? If the answer is yes, who do we tell? Who do we share our math with? And that's really the power of the whole thing. You can say to the town council, we need more trash cans. But if you can show the town council why we need more and where we need them, isn't that a more powerful way to go about it? So in the, in the National Youth Science Day Facilitator's Guide, we will be helping you, leading you through the steps of the geographic inquiry process as you help the youth process their activities. So just briefly, we're going to talk a little bit about the activities. We're not going to talk a whole lot because you actually have a very extensive facilitator's guide to go with this. You'll notice that these facilitator guides, especially, and also the youth guide, um, are quite a bit longer than, than maybe you've been used to in the past. That's because we wanted to provide a lot of background information and a lot of um, information for the youth to use as well. So a lot of the things that I'm mentioning today you'll be reading about in more depth in your leaders or facilitators and youth guides. Um, so please please be assured that there'll be a lot more information um, available to you. So we have two activities in the actual youth and facilitators guides. Uh, they are both what we would call, call low-tech versions of GIS in that they don't require any technology. We designed it this way on purpose so that it would be accessible to, to youth and groups uh, no matter what kind of, of uh, resources they have available. So what we're actually doing is stimulating the process of making and using GIS maps and taking kids through the thought process that GIS map makers use. So this target age, as Beth mentioned, is for grades 4 to 8, but you can certainly adjust it up or down. The first activity is called Park It, Be a Layer Player. 
and youth will act as community planners. They're going to create a design for a pro proposed new park in a vacant lot in, the, in their town. They'll create some feature layers. So each group of youth or each youth will have a blank layer. They'll be choosing a card, which gives them a, a, a set of features that they're going to work on. Some of the features are existing, like there is a hill built in. There may be some water, some trees, some things that are already there. So they'll map those. And this is what we've actually got. The hill is already there. They'll need to work around that. And then we'll have other feature layers. So what buildings, what roads? what recreation equipment, what added kinds of, of water features, so pools or fountains or ponds. And they will they will each create a layer. Then they need to work on work on together and really using a lot of good communication skills to place those layers on top of each other and say, how does this all fit? So how do we have to be concerned about existing features as we add new things? As we add new things, how do we how do we make them all fit? How do we make sure everyone's needs are addressed? So it's really a very powerful way to look at a community planning process from a GIS aspect. Uh, for larger groups that create more than one map, there will also be a, a community feedback activity, really giving the idea of how in, in communities GIS planners can put out those maps and ask for citizen input. So they'll get to sim simulate that as well. In problem layers, let's talk trash. Youth will again create layers. Layers. This time they're helping the town of Sterling with their trash problem. They, they're going to be receiving information about trash that's been collected. And they're going to graph different kinds of trash on, again, onto transparent layers. They're going to layer those over, and then they're going to make some decisions about where we need trash receptacles, where we need recycling receptacles. And then they're going to have to base that around um, an economic thing in that the town only has a certain amount of money to spend. Uh, so this, again, is a way to see how you can actually do some data collection and solve some problems. Again, as I mentioned in the facilitator's guide, you'll find leaders' notes that will help you use the steps of geographic inquiry to process this. And I'd encourage you not to skip that part. Having kids reflect on and discuss their experience really helps them solidify their understanding, get their questions answered, and formulate new questions to explore. Uh, Beyond the two activities that I just mentioned, there will be listed online some higher tech activities that we'll use on the national map uh, core activities that will use ArcGIS online and that will con connect you to continuing um, on and using GIS in more technology-based ways. So this all sounds um, just as an elephant is intimidating. You know, the closer you get to it, the bigger it is. The same can be said about geospatial technology, but don't let that overwhelming elephant stand in your way of success. Um, commit to taking one bite at a time. And how do you start? First, you kind of gather your silverware, you know, your resources, your tools. Begin by thoroughly reading that facilitator and youth guide. Get familiar with the activities, and then look around. Who are the individuals, businesses, politicians, maybe community organizations? that would it, be, it would be beneficial to involve in your NYC event? Are there individuals or groups who might have some geospatial knowledge or experience that you could invite to be a partner in conducting the event? Investing the time and getting your, soft, your silverware together will develop, to develop a well thought through strategy will pay off in not only a successful event, but it hopefully will spring into additional opportunities for your program. Next, choose a spot you can reach. Tackle the easiest place to see first, and NYSC is situated to provide you something you can easily reach. As you tackle the NYSC activities, you build confidence and expertise as you go. It also gives you a platform to develop those new relationships with strategic partners. Maybe it's financial. Maybe it starts as a professional doing a career share that evolves to be an affair judge, which leads to serving as a French project volunteer. Then take a bite. You gotta begin. Dive in, try it out, reevaluate, revisit your strategy. And then finally just keep repeating number three until you're finished. Just remember our main goals here are to spark the interest of science and geospatial science among the youth we serve and among our current and potential stakeholders. Those adults who we want their vested interest to be in supporting 4 H. We don't have nor do we need to have all the answers. But let NYSC be the first site in sparking that interest that will hopefully ignite that flame that will continue 
beyond October. So prepare now to take action. Plan out your media strategy. Begin now with your working with your local news media. Determine the best time to hold the event. Get on their calendars and get on the calendars of your, your stakeholders. Ideally, you want to hold the events on or as close to October 1st, but again, you know, go with the date that works best for your media and your, media and your partners. Just realize that the events have to be held prior to November 1st to be eligible for the Innovation Award. Then get each of your events registered on the NYSC site. If you plan different events, multiple events, register them separately. And then you can report on them separately. Go ahead and place your orders for the NYSC kit. And we also want you to go to a different website, 4h.org slash my4h. Add this URL to your browser's bookmark. This is where we'll be making the recorded webinars and other various resources available. If you log into my4h using the same username, which is your email, and the same password as you do for the NYSC site. There's two things you can begin searching for on the my4h site. One is Science Day, and the other is My4H Tools. The Science Day tag is the universal tag we'll begin using to help our users locate additional NYSE-related resources. It's also the tag we want you to add to any resources you have to share. So while you'll be registering your events and finding the specific 2013 NYSE resources on the 4H.org slash NYSE site, you'll find additional resources from the Geospatial Task Force, as well as, we hope, from one another on My4H. We know many of you have created, tweets, come across some great resources that would support Science Day events and science programs. Please use the My4H site to share them with others. That way we can all benefit and learn from one another all year long. Now, if you're not familiar with the Next Generation My4H site, which launched this past March, go to the site and search the tag My4H Tools. You'll find resources to help you get started on the site, including a My4H orientation webinar. If you encounter additional questions regarding the site, feel free to drop me an email or phone call. I'll be happy to help you out. And our contact information will be listed here at the end of the webinar. Kim, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, well, thank you. On behalf of the NAE4HA Geospatial Task Force, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. We, well, as you see on the screen, we invite you to join us for the three remaining GEO webinars as listed at the same time and the same location. We anticipate having the recording from today's webinar available on the My4H in the upcoming week. But before you go, we'd like to take at this time a little, to gather a little feedback from you on today's webinar before we head into the question and answer portion of today's webinar. So before you sign off, please take just a minute or two, make sure you've submitted your zip code as this will help us account for our week and answer three brief polls that should now be visible on your screen. I'll open the floor to anyone who has questions. and I've also um, been monitoring the chat and we will start with those. Also, feel free to reach out to members of the GeoWebinar Committee, and their contacts will be posted. And thank you again, everyone. Have a great day.